we renew ourselves? How many of you uh, went Black Friday shopping? Go ahead and raise your hand if you're Black Friday shoppers. Four people are doing that, right? Okay, well, maybe this won't work at all. Black Friday, because only in America people trample each other for sales exactly one day after being thankful for what they already have. Isn't that a great little meme? Now, some of you are like a little older like me. Do you remember the Black Friday sales? Like it was 5 a.m. and you were elbowing and punching people to get there. Anybody remember that? Like that was a lot of fun. I miss those days. That's too easy now. You just click buttons. I don't like it. We need to go back to the old ways where we just like, we got to work for it to get those particular um, gifts. Um, We are going to do this series today. We're going to do this one, not series, this one day thing. And I'm going to peek behind the curtain just a little bit. Uh, My name is Nate. My wife's name is Rochelle. And she teaches as well. She's a really, really good teacher. We have three different churches within one church. We have our online church, which is great. We have the Manuka campus, which you're a part of right now. And we have the Seneca campus. Well, Rochelle is teaching at the Seneca campus right now. And she wrote the introduction for this. And those of you who are married, just I'm going to read it word for word what she said about me. And you guys are maybe get a little a t- a, a tickle out of this. Here we go. I, these are her words, not mine. I, in parentheses, Nate, get cranky during the holidays. Is anybody married to someone like that? Okay. Um, I'm not what you call a quote unquote festive guy. Okay. That's how she describes me. I like routine, simple, and uncomplicated. What's wrong with that? Like, I think that's just fine. Um, I don't know when you put up your Christmas tree, but at our house, Rochelle goes insane. I mean, she really is great at decorating. But the worst part of our Thanksgiving is the moment I realize we have to carry the Christmas trees, plural. We have three, okay? Christmas trees up from the basement. Christmas comes every year, but it's a shock to me at all of the work. Trees, outdoor lights, dot, dot, dot. And then she's describing me thinking this. My life is hard, okay? It's just really hard. And then always about a week before I get angry at all the additional things I have to do. I have Christmas services, people in need, and we have to go buy gifts for not only Rochelle and others, but the grocery store, you got to go like 500 times to get all the right things. Now, granted, I don't have to buy anything for anyone else, do any wrapping or decorating or cooking, but still, do the holidays just kind of drive you a little crazy, okay? Is anybody else like with me on this? Like it's a little nutty around here, and we kind of go crazy between, you know, the day after Thanksgiving and and Christmas Day. You may love the holidays. It may be the best time of the year for you. You may hate the holidays because it brings about painful and difficult experiences or reminders, but we all have something in common, okay? We all have something in common, and that is we just want to, we want to do it a little bit better. We want to, like, get it right this year. So I'm going to have this statement on the screen. It says, the, de- the desire to renew, to, like, really get it right, the desire to renew some part of our lives it, that isn't due to our circumstances, the time of year, even our choices, rather the need for renewal is a basic human desire. So we're going to talk about renewal today. If you have your Bibles, turn to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, if you have your paper Bible, it's in the New Testament, just a, a few over from Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans. If you have your Bible on your phone, which so many of you do, I'd love for you to pull that out. Maybe you can show your kids, you can look at the scripture together, or maybe you could have the kids show you how to use the Bible on your phone. You know, kind of one of those things. However that goes, Romans chapter 12, verse 1, it says, Therefore, and I want to stop right there. Anytime you see the word therefore, bells and whistles and lights should go off everywhere in your heart and in your mind because it's a transitional word. It's saying because of all the things we just said, here's what we're supposed to do. So what all happened in Romans chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, all the way through 11? Well, there's a lot of things. Romans three twenty three, 23, uh, Paul noted, and this is good theology, that uh, we have all fallen short of the glory of God. We've all sinned. We all make mistakes. Romans six twenty three. but the gift of God... Um, is is forgiveness and and the gift of eternal life. And so he gave his life for us. Romans chapter 10, 9, if we confess with our uh, mouth and believe in our heart that Christ is Lord, we'll be saved. Romans chapter 6, that we were therefore buried with him in baptism. So we went to that, away from that old life, we're raised anew into a new life. So there's all this theology of like, we need God's help. He provided the help. We accept it. And now therefore, what do we do? It says, I urge you brothers and sisters in view of God's mercy to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. I love to teach on this verse, and I love to ask this question. What's the problem with a living sacrifice? Anybody know? It's pretty simple. 
it can crawl off the altar, okay? Like, it's like, yeah, we want to give our whole lives to you, God, and then it's like, this is hard, and we like say, forget it. You know, we're going to do it our way. So offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, for this is your true and proper worship. This is really, really important. When we place our entire lives in God's hands, he shapes us into what he wants us to be. When we place a portion of our lives, hey God, we're going to give you this, this, and this, but we're going to keep this for ourselves, we limit the work he can do in our lives. Let me say that again. It's very important. When we place our whole life into his hands, he can do remarkably wonderful things because he's God. But when we only give him this amount, we limit the work of an almighty, all-powerful God, what he can do in and through our lives. So my challenge to you today is don't limit. Like when you put it all in, and we, we all do this, like let's go all in, holy and pleasing to God. We're a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is how we actually worship him. Verse 2, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be, say the next word, but be transformed. I love these transformers. That's a really cool thing that, that Amy did. By the renewing of your mind. Let's talk about transform, and then we're going to talk about the underlined renewing of your mind. In the original language of Greek, this particular word, transformed, is actually transformed metamorpho. Everybody say that with me. That's a fun word to say. Ready? Metamorpho. One more time. Metamorpho. In the English language, what do you think our word is for that same Greek word, metamorpho? Metamorphosis. You're very bright. Good job. And when you think of the word metamorphosis, what do you think of? What's the visual image of that? Cata caterpillar becoming a butterfly. So um, I like caterpillars. Um, I think they're really cool. And I want to do a little kind of fun experiment. I want everybody to hold your hand out just like this. We've got the kids in with us. It's going to be very experimental. I want you to imagine that you've got the caterpillar. I like to call them woolly worms. So I'm going to call it a woolly worm. That's how I learned what it was. Imagine you've got a woolly worm in your hand. What does it feel like? What's it feel like? It's, what did you say? Fluffy? Fuzzy. Thank you. It feels fuzzy. It kind of feels weird. They got a bunch of legs, right? So they're all kind of walking everywhere. Did anybody else ever have the experience? This is kind of gross. So I'm going to go ahead and go there. That when you hold a caterpillar in your hand, what does it generally do? It poops in your hand. So that kind of feels gross. But let's not go there too long. So you've got the caterpillar in your hand. And it's just kind of this beautiful little thing. And it's walking around. And you can hold it. And then something happens. It goes and it makes a cocoon, and it becomes a what? Later on, it becomes a butterfly. So you can take your hand in at this point. Now I want you to think about, just for a moment, the woolly worm, does it look like it can fly? Does it, no. Does it look like it can, like, form wings? Like, that transformation is radical. It's unlikely. It's actually impossible on our own. But when we give our lives as a living sacrifice to God, and we say, we're going to give everything to you, God. We're going to put it all in your hands. He holds us as a little woolly worm, and we're fluffy, and we're kind of cool, and all those different things. And he's like, I got something better for you. I'm going to transform your life so that you can fly. I'm going to transform your life so you can do things you never thought possible for the kingdom of God. This isn't like when I was a kid, like, God, make me taller so I can dunk a basketball. You know, that's not what I'm going for, okay? It's like, God, use my life for whatever you want to use it for to do all the things that you'd want to do. That's an amazing, amazing thing. Well, how do we do that? We renew our mind. You renew your mind every single day. You think about, you think about, you think about, how do I put my life in your hands, God? How do I give it over to you? You think about where am I not giving it over to you so I can re return that back to you, let you do your work, even though it's kind of hard, even though there's a painful process. Think about the cocoon. We don't really see what's going on in there. There's a lot of things that are changing, and then they got to break through the thing. It's, it's, it's a process. It takes time. Verse 2 um, says, do not conform to the pattern of this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then the second part of that is then you go through this process you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Oftentimes people are like, hey, you know, what's God's will in this situation? Nate, pastor, how does this work? What should I do? All these different things. And my first instance, whenever people talk to me about these things, I say, okay, tell me how long have you prayed about it? 
How much are you in the scripture about it? How are you kind of talking to other people so they can give some insight into it? And usually the answer is how long you prayed about it? Like, well, 30 seconds, okay? Well, how much scripture have you read? Well, like zero. Have you talked to anybody else who's older and wiser and mentor? Can it? No one. Like, okay, here's our opportunity. Here's our opportunity. Let's take 30 days. Let's start there. Let's test and approve what God's will is. As you go through that process, you start to get a sense and a feel and an understanding of where God would want you to go. We were working on this in October about a very specific project here at the church. We thought we had it figured out. And then in the early part of November, the answer was no. And I remember being upset about that. I know better, but I was upset. And we were in prayer time with our prayer team before each message, um, as before every Sunday, we go in the back room and we pray. So you've been prayed over today. Every chair has been prayed for. Every person has been prayed for. Before you even got up, people were praying for you. And they were praying for me. And one lady said, hey, this is an amazing thing, God. We thank you for the blessing of no. So now we'll know what your plan is instead of our plan. And I was like, oh, that's, that's good. So it just takes time. We have to kind of test it out and, and figure out and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Uh, that's so incredible. Now I'm going to switch gears. I'm going to go to another scripture. This is all part of renewing our mind, renewing our hearts. In this holiday season, we're going to go to Philippians chapter 4, verse 4. Philippians chapter 4, verse 4. If you have your Bible, just flip over to that. That'll be really great. It says, rejoice in the Lord always, and I'll say it again, rejoice. What comes after rejoice? What punctuation mark? What is it? It's an exclamation point, okay? So the Bible didn't have like the... Um, you know, the emojis that we have whenever we can text each other, okay? So like if it had emojis, it would say rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. And it would give like the fist bump like 12 times, you know, and then like a bunch of other like really, let's go. This is great. We got to do this. This is very, very, very important. In the Bible, they didn't have that. So they just had to say, if they said it twice, it was a really, really big deal. By the way, it says rejoice in the Lord. What's the next word? Rejoice in the Lord. Oh yeah, always. I don't feel like rejoicing in the Lord all the time, do you? Sometimes I'm like mad and frustrated and sad and heartbroken. There's something, you know, if happiness is what happens to us, that's our circumstance. Joy is something that's inner, it's inside of us. Rejoice, we rejoice in who God is and what he's done, even in the midst of very difficult things. Let your gentleness be evident to all, for the Lord is near. Let's talk about that for a moment, that second part. Um, in the Old Testament, um, God was above us. Like he would say to David, do this, to Moses, do this, to Abraham, and he, the people would communicate that way. Uh, in the New Testament, when Jesus came, he was around us, which is kind of cool, right? But you had to be in his physical presence to be around God. And then he died, was risen again, and then sent us the Spirit of God, God's Spirit that lives in us. And now no matter where you are on planet Earth, anywhere, anytime, God can be with you us. Re let your gentleness be evident to all, for the Lord is near. He's right here, right now. Years ago, I had the privilege and the honor of being able to officiate my grandma's funeral. You think, well, that, what's a privilege? Because she lived a life that was just amazing servanthood to God. She just loved God. She was such an amazing follower of Jesus, even to the point that when I was in college, I think I was out of college, and she was like, Nathan, you're going to be the one that's going to officiate my funeral whenever that happens. I'm in my 90s, so it's going to happen at some point pretty soon. So I want you to say these words at the funeral. I want you to tell the story of whenever you guys were little, and you were down in the basement, uh, the, heart, the house in Carthage, and you guys were plotting something out. You guys were figuring out something with the, with the um, cousins, and you remembered that I, Grandma, was upstairs. And you, you said, or someone said, Hey, guys, remember, we can't do that. Grandma's upstairs, you know? And she said, I want you to tell that story at my funeral and let everybody know that even though I'm not here, I'm still watching, and Grandma's upstairs, so you guys better do it the right— isn't that a great grandma kind of a thing? I think sometimes we got to remember he's here. He's here. And he's watching. And that's both a blessing— and also a good kind of check in our heart and spirit. So if we're going into things that are like completely inappropriate, maybe we should not do those things because God is, he's with us. And maybe our gentleness could be a lot better with one another because he's near. We could handle ourselves in a little bit of a better way. Gentleness. Verse 6, 
Do not be anxious about anything, but in, say the next word, but in every situation. So that like really covers it, okay? And by the way, in the original language, every situation means every situation, okay? I don't have to, it's like everything. By prayer and, say the next word, by prayer and petition. That's fascinating. With, say it with me, thanksgiving, present your requests to God. So the Bible says, do not murder. Does everybody agree with that? Just raise your hand if you agree with that. We shouldn't murder. Good. The Bible says, do not lie. Go ahead and raise your hand if you agree with that. That's a good one. The Bible says, do not like the Packers. It doesn't say that. I'm teasing. Everybody raise their hand. Yeah. But they're killing us. They're just absolutely killing us. So I got off track there. That wasn't in the notes. Um, Do not murder. Do not lie. Do not worry. Do not be anxious. That's a command. It's not a suggestion. How many of you worry? You don't have to raise your hand. I do. I'll raise my hand. I worry every day. I'm anxious all the time. So what's the solution to that? In every situation, I go to prayer. I give it to God. I say, God, here, I need your help. I need your help. I need your help. And when that's not enough, I go to petition. So fast story. Um, When I was 23 years old, I led my first ever missions trip, 19 high school students and seven or eight adults. And we we were supposed to go from Chicago here down to Mexico City, uh, catch a bus, go to San Luis Potosi, and be at a missionary thing for a whole week. It was great, in theory. We got there the day of, and our paperwork wasn't correct. The Mexican uh, group changed the paperwork, and so we had all of these minors under the 18 whose paperwork wasn't correct, so we had to fax back and forth and do all these different things. And meanwhile, the adults went on to—they were okay. They went on to Mexico City, and then I, 23 years old, took 19 high school students to L.A. by myself. Had never—I'd flown once at that time. This was my second-ever flight— and we had to figure out, like, baggage, like, how do you get your bags, and then rebook onto another flight. And, of course, all the 19-year-olds are like, this is awesome. We're in L.A. Let's just go outside and walk around and ingle. What could possibly go wrong? And I was just, like, absolutely at my wit's end. We were at LAX Airport. If you've ever been there, it's the, one of the most busy airports in the world. And I was just wiped. And in LAX, if you can imagine this, there was over the loudspeaker for the whole world to hear... Uh, paging Nate Ferguson. Nate Ferguson, can you please come to the uh, nearest convenience phone? I'm like, what is going on right now? Like, this could, how could this possibly get any worse? I go to the convenience phone. It's a lady from our church, Connie. And she said, Nate, I'm a travel agent. You're going to be okay. I'm going to talk you through how to get through this. You're going to be fine. And I was like, oh, thank you, because I don't know what to do. I was just a mess. And she said, but before I talk you through that, can I just pray for you? And she gave the most beautiful prayer. And that's what that verse is. In every situation, I was in a bad situation. I was in a real mess. And I was praying. Trust me, I was praying a lot. And it wasn't taken, okay? I need someone to petition on my behalf to God. I need someone to pray over me. And she did. And it was wonderful. So if you're going through a really, really tough time and you need a little help, let me just encourage you, okay? Get someone to pray for you. That's why we have our prayer time at the end of each service. We ask people to come forward. We're going to pray over you. That's why you can text or call at any hour of the day so that we can pray for you. By prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. It's easy to say, hard to do. And what's it look like practically? Well, it's like this. Stop the spiral. Sometimes we just get so worked up and anxious. and We're just spiral, spiral, spiral. And the way you stop that is by praying and if that's not enough, you ask someone else. You petition, hey, can you, can you help me with this? I'm, I'm really having a hard time. And you stop the spiral with thanksgiving. We become thankful. We have an attitude of gratitude at all times and in all places. And then here's, here's how God responds in verse 7. God says, I'm going to send the peace that only I can send. The peace of God, it transcends all understanding. You can't describe it. You can't put words to it. And not only am I going to do that, I'm going to guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. God says, I'm going to send you a peace. I'm going to send you a comfort, even in the midst of the craziness. You're going to be okay. 
and I'm going to guard it. By the, word, by the way, that word guard is a military term. So imagine like, you know, helicopters and tanks and a big fortress, and God's saying, I'm going to guard your heart, your emotions, and your minds, your logic. I'm going to guard both of those things because both, both of those things can sometimes get us into a little bit of trouble. Verse 8 of Philippians chapter 4. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, say these next four words. Ready? One, two, three. Think about such things. Millions and billions of dollars have been made in the quote-unquote self-help category of books. And you know what? Most of it boils down to, I'm going to save you a lot of money. Whatever you think about, and whatever you feed your mind, and the people you surround yourself with is pretty much all that matters. Because thoughts lead to feelings, feelings lead to actions, actions lead to results. Show me your friends, I'll show you your future. I could quote all of these things, and they're all based in this one little scripture of the Bible. The things we think about, the things we focus on, the things we feed our mind, that's what's most important. That's what's most important. Verse 9, whatever uh, you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice and the God of peace will be with you. Let me wrap that story with Connie. Um, So we get everybody's bags figured out. We get on a plane from L.A. down to Mexico City. They had to rebook everything, so there was only one seat that couldn't get on. Guess who didn't get to get on that plane? Actually, I did get to get on that plane. Guess where there was an extra seat? First class. (laughs) Which is a really cool thing, okay? (laughs) I get into first class. I can see all the 19 hoodlums behind me, and they're all having a blast. It's like the greatest day of their life. And I'm, I'm needing, like, another prayer. Because I'm uncomfortable. I'm in first. I don't know how these way fancy people and I'm 23 and I've never flown. And you know how good God is? Let me tell you how good God is for me in that moment. Um, the airline stewardess happened to be a believer. And someone had cued her in to everything that had occurred that day. And she just put her hand on me and said to everybody in first class, hey, this is a young man. It's like his second flight ever. And he's taken all these crazy kids that just got on to Mexico because they're going to do this incredible mission trip. And they've had a really rough day. Would you mind if we just prayed for him right now? And she did. Never ridden in first class and had somebody pray for me. Only God can do what only God can do. And we've got to give him room to show up. Here's what I want to challenge you with today. I want to go right to our action steps, if I may. To renew our lives, we must accept that Jesus makes us enough. So many of us, we're striving, we're doing this, we're doing that, and a lot of it is we're trying to prove ourselves, or we're trying, we're just insecure. I'll admit it, I'm insecure. We're not very comfortable in our own skin. And a lot of that has to do with we placed our identity in anything and everything but Christ. When you place your identity in Christ and you say, God, you do the work. I'm going to give you my life. You do what you need to do. You metamorpho me. Then we're enough. We're enough. He makes us enough. We remember who God is and what he's capable of. We remember who God is and what he's capable of. We pray and petition, and we change our thinking and our surroundings, and God goes to work.